Welcome to The Mountain Gardener with your host, Ken Lane. Gardening can be challenging, but with Ken's tips, tricks, and local advice, you'll reap huge rewards. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. And welcome to this week's edition of The Mountain Gardener, your host, Ken Lane, here talking about the landscapes of northern Arizona. And this is why we live in northern Arizona. We had a storm front come through. I mean, I think last weekend I was wearing shorts and t-shirts. It was so nice. It was so uncommon for January. Then we get a little storm front coming through and it really wasn't as cold as I thought it was going to be. I actually thought there'd be some snow and some more, at least here in Prescott. We saw some flurries, but nothing accumulated so far. And so we need some. We need it to be colder, but we're a four-season climate, but really mild. And that's why we that's why we love northern Arizona. It's just so nice up here. If you drop down to, let's say, Black Canyon City, uh, down down to that 3,000 foot level and below, that's a whole nother type of way of, of gardening. So there, it, nothing translates from down there to up here. And and vice versa, nothing up here translates down. Everyone wants a lilac down in Phoenix. I'm going, well, it just doesn't have enough chilling hours. It needs to have so many hours of cold in winter before it triggers blooming. Fruit trees, the same way. There's desert varieties of apples, and there's desert varieties of, or, or mountain varieties of apples, and, and they don't grow in each other's zones or each other's climates. So you need to get the right variety for your landscape. Your, and the, ele, the demarcation line, the, the elevation line, really seems to be Black Canyon City. You come up that hill, up I-17, all of a sudden you top out at Cordes Junction, Spring Valley, and those areas, and it's a whole other type of, there you can see some snow. It gets frost. It's four seasons. Just a few miles down the hill, it doesn't. But then you see Suaru starting to grow on the side of the hill going down I-17. You see that. You can see where the zone is changing right before your eyes within just a few miles. And that's what I love. Another reason I love Arizona. I can go from Prescott, Arizona. I can go north and go skiing all day long up in Flagstaff. It's beautiful. And then I can go within the same day almost, run down the hill and go golfing down in Phoenix. It's just beautiful. That's what we love. It's like magic. No other place in the country is like this. But when you start planting, that's why you want to hone in on when is you want to work with your environment with your changes of the season and not against it. And so sometimes you're bringing your habits from Phoenix. You're bringing your habits from Georgia, from Florida, from L.A., from wherever, Nevada. And you're bringing them here. You're trying to do the same things at the same time. And, and you wonder why you struggle. One idea is roses. We are famous for roses. So so the high altitudes, roses love growing in the central highlands so throughout Arizona. Um, many, many roses are actually started from cuttings down or from rootings or graftings down in Phoenix. They're started there in huge beds, tightly packed, and they'll harvest those and pot them up all around the country uh, in, in containers. And they'll flush them out, fill them, and groom them for a year or two. And then they sell them in these big five-gallon plants. Well, they're grown there. And if you grow roses in Phoenix, they do wonderfully. But you'll typically prune those in November. December. Here in the mountains of Arizona, we do not want to do that. It's totally opposite. It's because of the altitude. So here, we want that structure of that plant, that those that rose specifically. I find uh, um, autumn sage is the same way. Some plants are like this, where it's better to keep that foliage up or over that plant and until the harshness of winter is over, and we're not done. I know it's January and it's beautiful. You new timers, you, this is your first season. You kind of get lulled into this. Oh, this is going to stay like this. Nope. It's going to get cold again. There'll be another snowstorm. There'll be another frost. And really, that can happen any time until the mid to end of April. It can just happen. Then it just gets glorious. It's just beautiful. But it'll be beautiful during the day in March, in mid-February. It's, it's glorious now. It just gets real cool at night. Well, that messes with some plants. And so you want to keep that foliage up on that plant to protect the cane or those grafts. So here, rosarians, local rosarians, we, we use March as our 
month to prune roses. And it, it'll hurt you because they're starting to bud. You're seeing leaves out. And you're going, oh, I, I should have done it earlier. No, you just want to wait till the harshness, that that bitter cold. And it can happen all the way up until the end of February. It could be really that bone chilling cold. And that's if it gets down to the graft and damages that graft, uh, it, it can affect your rows. So we keep the foliage up. Then we prune them back. I've, I've actually cheated to the end of February, but really March is what local rosarians, that's the, the, the calendar month that you're pruning roses here in the high country. It's unique to this part of of Arizona, of the Southwest. So you need to know, get in that rhythm. Another one we use is Mother's Day for the lower elevations. Let's say Prescott, Prescott Valley, even Sedona. Uh, maybe, it's, maybe it's the end of April. Uh, we'll use the last frost date for Kingman, some of the Cordis Junction, Spring Valley. Um, it could be as high as Memorial Day for Williams, Flagstaff, White Mountains. So, but basically we're using May is our last frost date. That's our time. That's our demarcation line. That's our, that's our date. We go, oh, we can start planting summer things. Zinnias can go in. Oh, the uh, uh, bougainvilleas can go in. All that thing, things that do not like frost will wait till after the last frost. Before that, we're planting lilacs. We're planting forsythia. We're planting fruit trees. We're planting... Uh, not tomatoes. They don't like the cold. Well, I, I wait till the end of May to plant mine. Uh, but I will plant my uh, lettuce and cauliflower and spinach and pansies and petunias. They love the spring. They love frost. They're okay with that. They do better when it's cool. They struggle in the heat. So you need to know in your yard where that line is. And so one that we use first and last frost. So Prescott, Arizona, this is our first frost. In fact, May 8th is our last frost of the season. That's 100 years of data. It seems to land on May 8th. Now, this year could be a little sooner. It feels like spring is going to hit early. So I predict probably the third or fourth week in April, you can start planting tomatoes. You're all in. Go for it and not have to worry about frost. Now, you folks with greenhouses, you're going, <laughs> I don't have to listen to all that because uh, I got a greenhouse. I can, I store all my stuff inside. Well, that's cheating. That, that's for those of us that work with nature, not artificial bubble called a greenhouse. Okay, you can cheat it a month, six weeks, two months almost. So the rules are off for you all. That's a beauty of having greenhouses. But for the rest of us, the common folks, we're using May 8th as the last frost date of spring. The first frost date, we usually use as, as Halloween, but really the official 100 years of data, October 29th. That's when the first frost typically hits. Now, this last year, 2020, now everything was weird in 20. So we're trying to, trying to erase all those memories. But remember we had that freakish uh, frost. When was that? First of April or something like that. It got real cold, then it turned nice again. That was weird. That's not normal. Normally, we don't have that until October 29th. That's a funny thing about averages. So it's never May 8th. We, we use Mother's Day as a holiday, which is typically somewhere in there. Uh, we're watching it. So at least we've got a holiday we can focus on. Halloween, it's not exactly there, but we kind of have a, we, we know what to put it on our radar. Uh, but it's something to watch so you can go cover sheets. You can, you can go plant earlier. I can all plant some tomatoes in my gardens first of April, but I've got them protected. I've put them in walls of water. There's some plant protectors. You put a little mini greenhouses over each and every plant. I don't commit my ent entire garden to it. Just a few kind of, I mean, I have a radio show. I got to brag about that first tomato. It needs to be at least a week before you pick yours. And so I'm trying to cheat it a little bit. I am planting fruit trees, evergreens, uh, you can go carpet roses, forsythias. We got some beautiful, beautiful Arizona cypress in, beautiful um, Austrian pines, pinyon pines. So you can start planting. You just have to be wise at what you're planting and when. And so that's where knowing your garden sources, knowing your garden centers, know the professionals that kind of been in there, or know your neighbors that have, that have been gardening for years. They love sharing information with, with neighbors and friends or fans or other gardeners. All right, got a lot in store this show. Don't go anywhere. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane, owner of Waters Garden Center in Prescott. 
Join him every week for timely garden advice right for the gardens. Visit Ken where he can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Hi, Ken here with the Plants of the Week and our Arizona Cypress. If you want low-maintenance natives, easy care, and reduced water use, then this is the evergreen for you. When planted in rows, they block the wind, traffic noise, and make the perfect privacy screen, all for under 40 bucks. Comes in an Arizona blue, easy to grow, and prefers monsoon planting. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott, where people who love native evergreens, they love to shop. My living room feels so empty. Now that the Christmas tree is gone, the house just seems so blah. Brighten it up with a big, bold, beautiful plant from Waters Garden Center. Fill that cavernous space with tall tropicals, colossal cactus, and sizable succulents that bring the great outdoors indoors. Make a gorgeous green space you can enjoy all year, not just for a season. Unique, exclusive, one-of-a-kind houseplants found only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. You've been listening to Ken Lane, the Mountain Gardener. Green thumbs learned while working in the Family Garden Center. Now welcome back to the Mountain Gardener. All right, we are back. We've got Lisa Waters Lane in the studio. She comes each week with your garden questions. And this week, we've been travel buddies. We put 2,000 miles on the brand new car we just got. Not brand new, a different used car. And uh, just give it a test drive. Nothing like buying it and going 2,000 miles to see if it actually works. It did. (laughs) Went to go visit our kids in uh, Texas. Texas. Colleen, Texas. Mm -hmm. Fort Hood. Our son is a captain. He's a PA for basically some, I, I'm not sure what, once your kids go up high enough, you start to forget what they do. <laughs> they, they're doing a lot. You can't quite keep up, but he's doing important stuff, yeah. what he says. So <laughs> I'm sure he is. We're proud of him. Anyway, we picked up our grandson mm-hmm. and took him to Houston. Went to Houston. Did the Natural History Museum. Um, did Johnson Space Center. That was a big hit. That Johnson was a good Space. one. We did yeah. the symphony. That was a huge hit. Uh, we did the aquarium. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you can skip the Houston aquarium. It's not worthy. <laughs> so Sorry if you folks that are probably, <laughs> probably someone that created someone, the Houston yeah. aquarium retired to Prescott, Arizona. So <laughs> apologize for that. But yeah. uh, there are better more intense, better, more enthr- more engaging. Yeah, it was okay. Yeah, it was okay. But it was a very fun trip. Really enjoyed spending time with our grandson and just getting to know him better and him knowing us better. And we good. have a, a deal with our kids, with our grandkids. When they turn 10, we will take them someplace, just their grandparents. And, and it's not Disneyland or something fun. It's it's educational. <laughs> No fun. Uh, yeah. You're not allowed to It's fun, fun, but it's not just rides. <laughs> it's learning what's more about yourself yeah. or trying to engage their giftedness and trying mm-hmm. to bring that out so they can see bigger, see down the road farther, see see what we see in them, that we can yeah. speak into them some and hopefully bless them. So, And then it blesses us with a memory, blesses them with a memory, yeah. and hopefully we'll see great things out of them. Right. COVID got in the way of that. So it he, delayed it for a year. Oh my gosh, yeah. stupid COVID. I'm so tired of it. Omicron, go away. <laughs> so it, um, he turned 10 last April. Right. And we, you couldn't go and anywhere. We finally just. Yeah. yeah, we've had, that's it. Omicron or not, we're going. We didn't get COVID yet. So far, we've been <laughs> back for a few days and still we're good. Yeah. So I'm amazed. But uh, went, went, did all those things were open in Texas. They, they were. were. They were sort of safe you were safe everyone else kind of went oh i'm not sure so anyway it just kind of worked out but it, i was impressed with uh, the natural history museum the amount of gems and rocks and minerals wow. and oh my gosh that is huge over there yeah. that museum we yeah. i don't know how many hours we spent all day looking at stuff i mean yep yeah. they had the plastic plastique the, the bodies they inject with plastic and then they show you what a lung looks like, what skeletons look like. Did that, mm-hmm. did the, the shell muse, the shell shells and gems, right. huge. They're dinosaur displays, huge. ginormous. Mm-hmm. So it's exciting. It was, we should probably do some garden tips. We should. So people don't care about our <laughs> travel advice about Houston, Texas. Yeah. Half the people went, Texas, who'd go to Texas? The other half, our Texans going, why wouldn't you? <laughs> 
<laughs> well, well, we'll do some garden questions and move out of that. Okay, so Roger has a, a year old Deodora cedar. It's been in the ground a year. He has very heavy clay soil. He's noticing this winter that it seems to be yellowing quite a bit. He's only been watering once a month, uh, but wants to know maybe it's an iron deficiency, just winter color. Um, yeah. What are your thoughts on? Yeah, so that's winter chlorosis. It's short days. Well, it's heavy clay, kind of brings out all the issues. Right. So that's a challenge. But once a once a month, about right for those heavy clay soils. Uh, the the older established gardens out in Chino Valley are beautiful. They've been farmland for years. They they perk. They grow everything. All the new subdivisions. That's terrible soil. So up on the knolls or the ridge lines, terrible. Heavy clay, caliche layers, rocks. And so that that um, that alkalinity builds up, which accentuates all that yellowing. And then just the short days. So what to do? Uh, all of your evergreens, if you've got heavy clay, I encourage you to fertilize your plants, the entire landscape with all-purpose plant food in midwinter. It seems counterintuitive but it keeps them green. There's a lot of sulfur. Uh, there, there's cottonseed meal, which is, it's very acidic. You want to bring that pH down and then green that plant up. And it'll really encourage, not only green them up, but it will set the stage for next spring's growth. So Diodorus usually start elongating that new growth the end of March, April. Well, it'll help you extend more of that growth and, and greener, richer, thicker growth. So highly encouraged, especially a new plant. It's only one year old. It, it, you, you, at least you're monitoring it, watching it. That's right. great. And so that'll help. If you've got any of the root and grow leftover, so you probably planted that. If you got it from us, we encourage, we make our own compost tea that's made for transplant shock. Well, that will also, it's, it's compost tea, so it's very acidic. It's a concentrated liquid. It's available right now. That could really help you. If you get mm -hmm. some of that leftover, you can't put a gallon or two on, three and a half tablespoons, makes a gallon. Put some of that on. That'll help it green up right now. Mm -hmm. So good advice. Okay. Good, good tips. All right. Next question is from Angie. She wants to know when should she start trimming her blackberries and raspberries? Yeah. Um, they're going on year two. And she also kind of wants to know, is there... Is, is, how do you prune them? <laughs> oh, boy. So that's hard over the airwaves. Yeah. Uh, and it depends on the variety, which, mm -hmm. which variety that you have. So the, the Prime Gem series, we're trying to migrate all of our customers over to Prime Gem or more of them. Prime Arc. Prime Arc. It's, is that right? Yeah. I knew it was Prime. Prime <laughs> something raspberries and blackberries because they bloom on first, first year wood year. and second year wood. Older varieties of black, blackberries and raspberries only bloom on last year's new cane growth. Mm -hmm. So you really want to prune that when you're thinking through all the brambles, all of them, even not so much grapes, mainly brambles. You want to go after that big, thick, old cane growth. Get those things out of there. They don't produce new berries. It's the vibrant, new, actively growing, fast growing canes. They're all light green ones. Those are the ones that form the berries. Mm -hmm. So go after the old ones. That's what I can give you right away. Uh, bring a photo in, take a picture, bring it in. We can help you with a screenshot, help you figure out which ones kind of take out. Mm -hmm. um, but if you prune it right back to the ground, You'll have this beautiful new growth and no berries or very few berries. Right. That new Prime Arc series, that series elongates brand new growth and puts berries up and down that growth. Uh, light berries the first year, a lot of berries the second year. So it kind of takes some, some of that fudge mm -hmm. factor, help, allows you to make some mistakes yeah. and really works out. But that's that's you can fertilize now through March. Your timing's perfect. Go for it at your leisure. Fertilize them right afterwards with the fruit and berry food. We make a fruit and vegetable food that mm -hmm. is loaded with calcium that really brings out the flavor and the size of berries. I mean, fruit, fruiting plants, it's it's a game changer. But fertilize right afterwards, and you'll start to see growth here pretty quick. So they'll mm -hmm. start, you'll see green growth at the base in six weeks or so, starting. Yeah. So it's it's starting to happen. Okay. 
Next question is from Janet. She wants to know, are there any wildflowers that would do well in a fairly shaded area? Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. All of them will grow in shade, especially shade now, because there's a lot of shade now. There's less shade as we grow, as we get, as the days get longer, mm -hmm. even the shaded spots in June are bright. And so unless you're underneath the heavy canopy of trees or that north side of that house, it's pretty forgiving. We actually sell a, a few shade loving varieties. I think even poppies, you'll see those produce quite well mm -hmm. in, in the forest in between all the trees. We've got what's called a parade of poppies. There's seven different varieties of poppies in this one mix. You could spread that out in the shade and it would be magical, mm -hmm. absolutely magical. Uh, columbines, too, April, columbines, well. yeah. foxglove. Mm -hmm. There's so many uh, um, hookahs. We're starting to have flowers show up. We had a flower truck show up last week. House plants mm -hmm. and flowers. So we're starting to see flowers start to show up here at the garden center now. So yes, we do come see us and get you hooked up with the right shade wildflowers for your gardens. Ken and Lisa Lane, the Mountain Gardeners, be right back after this. You're listening to Ken Lane, a.k.a. The Mountain Gardener. Ken can be found throughout the week in Prescott at Waters Garden Center. Listen each week as he answers timely garden questions unique to mountain gardens. Gardening and you don't know where to start? Waters In-Home Garden Service comes to you and identifies what you have and how to make it better. Design advice, water strategies, vegetable and flower gardens, soil and food needs, and problem solving. Always problem solving. You'll instantly be a better gardener. All for just $200 of expert time with a coupon to fill your garden dreams without ever leaving home. In-home garden consultations from Waters Garden Center. We can be at your home this week. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Goshiki Holly. Goshiki translates from Japanese as holly with five colors. Its new leaves emerge red, then turn green. The entire top of this holly is draped in colors of cream, white, gray, yellow, and green. This evergreen makes the perfect accent, hedge, or evergreen container for its all-round good looks. A really nice plant that shines through winter is just $39. Waters Garden Center, where people who love Japanese gardens, they love to shop. You've been listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert Ken Lane. Join the conversation every week as he answers timely garden questions. Email Ken a question directly from your phone to his desktop through the web at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Now welcome back your host, Ken Lane. Last weekend's, or last week's garden column was on how to soils. And a lot of folks came in. So lots of folks are preparing their soil. Generally, you get your soils ready for your gardens, whether it's a raised bed, containers, uh, out there just in, 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 the, in the landscape someplace, in the gardens. And you get them ready, but you front load them with lots of nutrients, manures, soy, bone meals. You get them really invigorated. But you don't want to plant directly right afterwards. So you always want to get those things ready about a month ahead. And then you want to pray for rain. So you folks who were getting them ready last weekend, perfect. Now we've had some moisture. You want a couple more storms. And then you plant about a month away. So if the planting season is the end of February, first part of March, and that's when you start to plant your pansies, your violas. That's when you start to put in your ornamental kales. That's when you put in your lettuce, spinach, cauliflowers, carrots. I mean, just a whole series of things. Anything with a foliage, you're harvesting the foliage or the flower, let's say like broccoli. That's actually a flower bud you're actually eating. Those like to be planted when it's cool. The flavor comes out better. If you can plant those things and have it snow on them, have it frost, it makes the flavor get much deeper, richer. If you wait to plant those to more of the traditional, let's say when you plant tomatoes, when it's hot, the summer crops, they start to bolt. The flavor goes off on your lettuce. It just it loses it. It starts, the, the head of the cauliflower gets smaller because it's starting to bolt. You really want to plant those things early in the mountains of Arizona. So usually March is when you start. This year, it may be a little bit earlier. So that's the reason I'm getting my beds ready now. And so I'm ready to plant when those first crops. The next thing comes into seed or plant starts. Which one should I use? Well... For me, I, I'll start my radishes, carrots by seed. It's just the only way to do it. Um, but most things, I'm, I'm starting with a plant. 
And here's the reason why. Seed out in the soils, whether it's a container or a raised bed, wherever it's at, outside in the soil, when you've got a temperature that has these huge swings, daytime, so 40, 50 degree swings between daytime and nighttime, that messes with some of your seedlings. It's harder. It takes much, much longer to get the seed to germinate because the nighttime temperatures are so cool. If you're starting with a plant, let's say you're going to be six, eight, nine weeks ahead of the seed production time. So you're starting with a plant that's already going and growing. And so your, your take is much faster. So you have more success. And then the start time, you can regulate when it's actually starting to grow and, and in the gardens right away. So you can gain easily two months worth of growing season, two months worth of harvest, two months, you can gain two months easy by doing starts. This really becomes apparent with your warm season crops, tomatoes, things that form a, a fruit, carrots, or not carrots, um, uh, cucumbers and eggplants and beans and things that form you know, tomatoes, these things that are summer plants. You know, the locals here, at least in the Central Highlands area, this is Sedona to Prescott Valley to Paulden, this Central Highlands of Arizona, we use Mother's Day as the demarcation line between summer planting and spring planting. You do not want to put a plant that likes the summer. You, they don't like the frost. You want to wait till you're out of the frost potential to plant your summer plants. And those are things that form a fruit. And so that's usually Mother's Day is what we put. Before that, you're putting all your spring plants. This is when your lettuce thrives. This is when your spinach, cauliflower, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, all that stuff you're planting, you're harvesting the foliage. That's when they do better. If you're putting seed or if you're putting starts into your gardens, one thing that I didn't mention was what do I do with my containers and raised beds? Well, there I want to take the top layer where the roots are going to be receiving those new plants. I want some fresh potting soil in there. And so I'm going to take that top layer of my big container. I don't replace all the soil in that pot, but I replace the top layer and I'll, I'm putting fresh potting soil. Waters potting soil. That's our, our grower came up with that many years ago. And it's our growers mix. It's what we start seedlings and cuttings in. And so if you can put a plant that's been, that's all it's known its entire life is waters potting soil. And you take it out of this six pack or four inch or gallon size pot and you put it into that, into your gardens and the, your gardens, the top layers, waters potting, more of that same soil they're going to go, whoa, this is great. I'm just going to keep on growing and grow, grow, grow. No transplant shock. Plants do not like to adapt to different kinds of soils. Just like you don't like to go from Arizona to a real humid climate. That's just hard on us. Or, or from warm to crazy cold. You don't like the, to change. And plants are just like people. They don't like different, they don't like changing their soil types. And so you can keep it the same, at least that top layer. So it's helping a customer with uh, some, some water troughs, big ones. So I want to, I want to top it off. Well, should I do the same form? I'm going now for you. It's different. You've already got it. You've already got soil there. Just put a couple bags of waters potting soil in this layer and plant directly in that. Don't till it in, plant directly in that and you'll have better success. So that's where this gardening has caveats to it. So, all right, that's enough about that. Be right back with Lisa Waters Lane after this. The Mountain Gardener, your source for timely garden advice right for higher elevations. Guaranteed to make a difference in your yard this season. Let's talk poop. Hey, I'm Tommy at Waters Garden Center. Ken and Lisa are out right now, so I snuck in to remind you that it's time to add some manure to your garden. It's been a wet winter, and your soil is, well, pooped. Waters Barnyard Manure adds nutrients to get your garden growing. It's organic and odorless, so we really can say our poop don't stink. Buy six bags or more. They're only $5.99. Now that's a load of crap. Tommy, what's going on? Oh, poop, gotta go. Natural, safe, odorless, and organic at Waters Garden Center. Hi, Lisa with the Plants of the Week and our Austrian Pine. We have instantaneous trees just in and ready for planting. This pine has the same long needles as our ponderosa pine without all the problems. And these trees are really big and bold. This is the fastest growing of the pines and lots of sizes to choose from. But the $249 model is exceptionally big. Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. For people who love big, bold pines, they love to shop. 
You're listening to The Mountain Gardener with local expert, Ken Lane. Mountain gardening is very rewarding, with a few of Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts sure to turn your thumbs even greener. Now welcome back to The Mountain Gardener. Lisa Waters Lane in the studio with us. So she comes each week with your, just what, what are you seeing in the gardens? What's going on? Uh, and so you kind of bring that extra special touch in my life and the listeners' lives. <laughs> How's that for an intro? There you go. So anyway, we uh, got back from Houston, took our grandson mm-hmm. there. We'd mentioned that in the second segment. And spring is starting to show itself in Houston. So oh, there yeah. it's a definitely a zone warmer. They're like a zone uh, eight, yeah. nine. I'd so there are a couple of clicks warmer than we are. Mm-hmm. Uh, so their plants go sort of dormant, but they still grow maples, but they mm-hmm. had the narcissus and the daffodils. They were starting to bloom. Mm-hmm. It's kind of exciting. The, the bud yes. swell on the plants were huge. Right. Uh, the uh, red buds just starting to crack and show flowers, but they got to be what, six weeks ahead of us. Oh, so, I would say at least. Yeah, yeah. They don't, we don't get that till what March when the, when the red buds start to bloom. Mm-hmm. So they're at least a month and a half month, right. month and a half ahead of us. So yeah. anyway, it's good to see. Yeah, it was very nice. And we we're still talking to each other after 30 some hours in the car together. <laughs> Maybe 40. I don't know. Maybe more. Cause it was <laughs> like forever. Tim Colleen, then down to Austin, Houston back up and over. Yeah. So quite a while, but Hey, we, we travel good. well together. We do actually. Yeah. Which is surprising, but we do. It's not surprising to me. Uh, I think it's joyous. <laughs> what are you telling? What are you telling the audience? What well, they don't want to well, know I your, mean, your that's baggage. A lot of, of hours together in a confined space. Bigger cars make for better <laughs> travel. I don't know. Anyway, first class and airplanes, cruise yeah, ships, yeah. luxury suites mm-hmm. make it make for better travel. Anyway, no, we don't do that. But yes. Anyway, but yeah. Texas gardening. takes forever to get across. Oh Does. my goodness. Gardening. You want to talk about gardening? We should. <laughs> okay. Well, in the time that we were gone, in the time that we got back, we got in all of our 2022 seeds. Yeah, it was very exciting. So vegetable seed, flower seed. So that whole wall, that area is just packed full of seeds. Yeah. And if last year is any experience, I would tell people, plan what you want and get it yeah, now. You may wait. not want to be planting it now. Of course, right. you don't want to put your tomatoes out now and that kind of stuff. But boy, get it early. Because the past couple of years have just been real shortages in the seed industry. And I'm not entirely sure it's back up to where it needs to be as far as supply. Um, So I would get in early and get those. And and some of the things that we, of course, a lot of vegetables, uh, early spring and warm season veggies. um, And a lot of different, not a ton of flower seeds, but ones that are hard to find. Or they're hard to find plants for, like nasturtiums. Um, I think I counted eight different varieties nice. of nasturtiums down there, yeah. trailing, upright, blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, peas. What's the pea? Uh, sweet peas, nap peas, sweet peas. Sweet peas. Gotcha. Is it the, one, the one that's real fragrant, yeah. the blue. Sweet peas. Um, hollyhocks. Um, some of those ones, some of the marigolds that are just, sometimes you can't always find them in, in planted, already grown but grow so easy from seed. There's no reason yeah. not to. So good time to get the oh, sunflowers. Got a lot of different types of sunflowers this year because they haven't been able to find them in years past. So, and then of course we have our new wildflower seed in. Uh, so it's definitely, if you're thinking ahead and you, you're one of those people who really loves to plan their garden out, now is the time to do it. Well, if you're doing you're seeds. not that, that far in advance no. before your early spring stuff, mm-hmm. like columbines, that kind of stuff. You need right. to plant those in February, yeah. March. You mean, it's, we're talking days away. Right. You should get your soil ready because it's you're almost there. Mm-hmm. But the reason there's a shortage is gardeners know what seed they want. And we had a customer come in, they bought 30 packages of zinnias. <laughs> There's any a gardener. They saw the new seed. They went, I want first dibs because I know mm-hmm. they're not going to be here. And we did get, we were shorted. Oh, yeah. they, they they just didn't fill right. our order we wanted. So we didn't get what we way over ordered. So we mm-hmm. got more of some other stuff, but yeah. still, yeah, don't wait. We're going to continue to way overweight our orders. So when they do zero, we still got plants right. or seed here. Mm-hmm. We're doing that with plants. So mm-hmm. 
Anyway, but yeah, good, good time to get in. Get Did the manzanitas come in? Manzanitas have uh, no. Okay, they're coming. <laughs> Yay, everything's coming. <laughs> so they should be here next week. But yeah, we have three different varieties of manzanita on the way. Um, and those are really kind of cool because we're probably going to get one big load yeah. and then maybe fill in. But that's yeah, another one no. that it's not like there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds coming along behind. There's yeah. limited crop availability. So if that's something you're interested in, don't waste your time. Wait, don't wait. Get in. And it's fine to plant them now. Oh, yeah. Easy. Manzanita, manzanita. They're natives. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's one that you don't find manzanita any place mm -hmm. but friendships we got a friend that grow that was his thing he mm -hmm. he, he figured out the variety how to do it how to propagate him a farmer right. we just said kurt we'll take 200 of those as soon as you get them going bring them mm -hmm. and then that i'm sure that's the only load we're going to have for the whole us maybe enough to get through spring maybe yeah. just depends there's so many new homes out there <laughs> that people are buying i'll take 10 at a time right uh so it just they go quick they do yeah. So speaking of other things that are coming in, so we also have um, some of our first load of blackberries and raspberries are Yay. coming in. So blackberries, we're going to have Freedom Arc, uh, which is that blooms on first year wood, first and second Perfect. year wood. So those are really nice ones to have. We're getting black satin, which is nice because it doesn't have any thorns. That's one we grow. <laughs> it's a great, great producer. Yes, yeah, great one to grow. And then uh, thornless boysenberries as well. And then we're starting to get our raspberries in. We're getting the canbies in, which... I think canbies are the most thornless yeah. one of a raspberry you can find. There's no true thornless raspberry out there as of yet. They gently caress you with thorns, <laughs> small, short, little, tiny ones that kind of, you can get in there without gloves right, and picks. Right. They're so, not yeah. big, nasty ones. Yeah. Uh, we're also getting some of our grapes in. We're getting Concord grapes in. We're getting uh, Catabuas, which is kind of that red, almost like a flame grape. Yeah. Uh, Niagara, which is a nice white seedless grape. So we're starting to get some of those in. And yes, you can plant those oh, absolutely. now. Yeah, well, they're dormant. Uh, they're so dormant. And then they wake up in their new home and they're happy and ready to roll. Yeah, they'll produce this year if you get them in the ground before they wake up. They'll produce mm -hmm. this spring. They'll start producing, right. or I guess, late spring, early summer. Mm -hmm. They'll start producing fruits. Yeah. yeah, they're in now, or they're on their way this week. Or so I see them clearing out greenhouses, yeah. getting the the pro, getting the display beds ready. So they're, something's about to happen. I can tell they're coming in next week. Yeah. I think uh, Thursday, Fridays we have gotcha. trucks. Our first trucks of the season coming good. in. It's actually exciting. very exciting. Also getting blueberries. Oh, uh, there. So we'll be getting Bountiful Blue, Northland, Patriot, and Sunshine. Uh, so if you've been thinking about blueberries, that's a good time to put and those my, in too. My mouth just watered. Nothing <laughs> like fresh blueberries off the bush. They're so pithy in the stores. They're just <laughs> fresh. They're just, they're bland. They don't have yeah. the same flavor as ripened right on the, on the bush. Mm -hmm. So definitely getting the, we're getting our, a few, very few. Uh, we're getting some peach trees in oh, just good. because we found them. We can get them in. Yeah. But peach trees are always those ones that are very popular and they go fast. Yeah. Um, we're also, I, I'm not sure if it's, I think it's next week, maybe the week after. We're getting our first load of lilacs oh, good. and forsythia. Wonderful spring bloomers. If you don't have those in your yard, you need those in your yard. Yeah. They're consistent bloomers. They do well here. Animal resistant. Um, and you know, you need something spring blooming in your yard. Every yard right. should have a lilac and every yard should have a forsythia. This is the country for mm -hmm. that. So, and they're so tough. Deer don't eat them. They're just, they're just perfect. Right. And we get different. We get the light blue color. We get the traditional purple, the old fashioned grandma's lilac, which common, is a not grandma gray. lilac. It's a common lilac. Mr. Lincoln <laughs> lilac, not grandma lilac. But it's a great, it brings back those memories <laughs> for people. Yeah, that's, that's true. I the that's grandma true. lilac. But, yeah. And then a two or three different varieties of the forsythia. So the trucks are starting to roll. Yeah, it's, it's, it's exciting. exciting. So it looks like spring might hit early. So it's, mm -hmm. I'm sure we're going to have one last bitter cold then oh, come back at do. it but yeah. you know, it's, it's starting to happen you're starting mm -hmm. to see the uh, cottonwoods and willows really green up so things yeah. are starting it's not here yet it's coming. tell it's happening <laughs> all right lisa lisa waters laying in with her garden report seed report <laughs> here at waters garden we'll be right back 
Look for more tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts through Ken's website. Podcast the show, read his weekly garden column, or follow him on Facebook and Instagram at watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Once upon a time, Fred the Sage and Bob the Yucca watched a herd of deer eat their neighbor's garden. Hey, Bob, said Fred. It's a good thing we're native Arizona plants from Waters Garden Center. Right, Fred, said Bob. We can handle tough prescott dirt, hot sun, low water, and we look great in the garden. You betcha, Bob, said Fred. Hummingbirds and bees love us, but that deer sure doesn't. Be like Fred and Bob. Go native at Waters Garden Center. Safe, natural, and organic. Did you know that plants can help you sleep better, naturally? At Waters Garden Center, we have beautiful houseplants that not only look great, they clean the air we breathe. Get this. Some plants can actually produce oxygen at night and even take mold spores out of the air, making for less tossing and turning and more beauty sleep. Don't lose sleep. Rise and shine with unique, gorgeous houseplants for your best rest yet at Waters Garden Center. Sweet dreams. Welcome to the Mountain Gardener with Ken Lane. Gardening in the mountains is different. Listen to Ken's tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts guaranteed to make your gardens more beautiful than ever this year. Now for better advice that works locally, welcome your host, Ken Lane. Now Lisa was talking about the last segment, the uh, landscape plants that screen things out. So she mentioned a lot of great big plants super so i was just helping a customer just let's just kind of taken off on that thought uh a customer came over with an ipad they're going oh i live in a, a block wall basically yeah and they had a whole bunch of plants they didn't like so they bought this house they had a whole bunch of fruit trees on the back side and they just didn't want that they wanted vines and well that's fine remodel it make it yours that's good uh and so they were, they were going to do trellis all the way along the back side of that fence they were asking can i put some more stuff in front of that and can i can i stagger it or stair step it um, towards the back patio well, yeah you can do that another idea would be take those trellises and there's lots of vines that will grow up that trellis and then typically they'll grow up about three feet above that fence let's say you have a five or six foot fence they'll easily grow let's say eight or nine feet tall maybe even taller so they'll go to the top of that trellis plus spill over up up the top. When you're trimming those back in the winter, trim them back, take some hedges and go as close to that trellis work, whatever that is, whether it's metal or wire or wood, trim it right back, honeysuckle, silver lace vine, wisteria, whatever it is, trim it right back as close as you can, akebia, and keep going, there's lots of vines close as you can, and then trim it back, trim it down to the top of that trellis, and then fertilize them. And by the, by, oh, the end of March, man, they will start growing and actively growing fast again. I just sold uh, four uh, Victoria pyracantha. These are the ones that have either orange or red berries to them. They're classic. I don't even know if they need to trellis up anything. They'll do it by themselves and hold themselves up. But many times folks will start to interwine them with trellises. And eventually they just have this great big green wall of pyracantha. As a kid, that's the one you used to pick the berries off of and you know throw them at each other. Birds love them. Uh, in fact, birds can sometimes get drunk on them. They'll go, they'll actually ferment and they're having a party back there. And your pyracanth, that's a great, uh, great plant for drawing more wildlife into your yard. Those are ideas. Now, sometimes you don't want the, the entire thing to be solid, the same, same kind of plant. It's kind of monotonous. It's called a monoculture. And it's good if you're doing formal gardens, but we generally have more informal, more natural looking gardens. So in the East Coast, you've got set patterns, geometry, set heights, everything is hedged perfectly. That's where the the boxwood is hedged right up to the front door at exactly the right height, knee height, squared off. And we we have some of that here, but, but really we have more wild or natural type of landscapes. With that, it's better to have a section of that wall be vines, or have a section be a a hedge, let's say it's uh, red dynamo photinia or uh, silverberry or eleagnus or euonymus. There's a whole bunch of stuff you can do there. Um, 
There you do a block of it, and then you might break it up and have, go with a different variety. For them, what I recommended was, why don't you do 8, 12 feet of one type of, let's say, honeysuckle or whatever vine you like, clematis. And then break it up and put a tree of some sort or a shrub, let's say a lilac, in between that. Give it about four feet and then go with another four or 12 foot panel of vines and then break it up, put another lilac. And so it gives it more interest. Yeah, and then you can you can step up or step down from there and have another layer. Let's say it's a flower bed in front of that. And there you've got roses or there you've got whatever you like, barberries or just perennial gardens. You can have some fun with it. So you get a design. So if you don't like the design you have, change it. We live in America, the wealthiest country that's ever existed. Uh, what's it going to cost you? you? Pull out a tree, you gardeners. I know that's sacrilege, but if you don't like it, it's just to tr get rid of it. That's why we were allowed to make chainsaws. <laughs> Cut that thing down and change it out the way you want. Um, another thing I, I tell folks, if you've got something, let's say there's a egregious two-story house and they're looking right down on top, you're breathing down on you. Sometimes you can blend in some very fast growing plants. Aspens grow really fast. Uh, poplars, sycamores, uh, willows, they grow really fast. In fact, they grow too fast. They're too big. But if you want something that grows fast, you put that in there and it, it fills out like in a season or two, it's like whoa, right there, they're blocked. But they're not long lived and they're too big for that space. Sometimes you can put in the smaller things you want to have more permanently. So design it permanently for your, let's say it's a pine tree or a, 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 you want a spruce or you want vines growing up there. Something that you want long term. But then I purposely put a sacrificial plant that grows fast right where that bedroom window, right where they're, they're living or right where they're, wherever that privacy point is and you want some privacy on your back patio. I know I only want that there for five years. And in five years, when the rest of the landscape catches up and has blocked that off, I know I'm going to cut that thing down. It's purposely there for a short term. I know this is a hard concept for some of you gardeners out there, but this is a living, breathing thing. I admit it, but it doesn't have to be forever. It can be just for a season or two. And then once the rest of my landscape matures, I can, I can get rid of that thing. Because a willow within you know, 10, 20 feet of your house, it's not, you're, it's trashy. It lifts, it lifts foundations. I mean, it, it lifts patios, walls. I mean, it's just, it's aggressive. Sycamore is the same way. They're trashy. They're always throwing stuff down. But for a season, it, it can work out really well to give you some privacy or some windbreaks or whatever. Block those headlights coming into your house until the juniper hedge gets tall enough or the Arizona cypress gets tall enough or the whatever thing you have. Just a concept I'll throw out there. Hedges, it's a good time. If you can get your, if you have privacy issues, if you can get those in the ground before, end of February, end of March for sure, before they wake up, if you can put them in the ground, so when they start to wake up for, from spring, they're going, whoa, we're, we're, what just happened? I went to sleep last fall and I woke up here. Well, I guess I'll just grow. And you'll get more growth out of them by planting them early. Late winter, early, early spring, it's just an ideal time to be planting uh, privacy stuff, whether it's a big old pine tree or a sycamore or whatever you happen to have. You need, if you need help with that, let us know. That's one. Take a picture. Let us know how long it is. You can't visualize what, how many feet that is, just linear feet. And then we can help you design that so it looks more natural, more like it just, like your house was built in the middle of this park, not, not a few plants were, were thrown out there. And uh, your house is, obviously your house is built. And then you, then you did the afterthought. Design is really super important. And the tighter the houses are, the more important it is because you're limited on how many units. Also, another one, if you've got a heavy pressure from deer, javelina, uh, rabbits, uh, the wildlife, your, your, their choices have really, you went from the 20 choices you could have had down to like five, a handful. Your design becomes really critical then because you've got to do something impressive with these five varieties that's not a monoculture. It's not all the same thing. 
so that's where some help. You can have an architect help you or just we do design. That's really what we do all day long here at the garden centers. We help people design well, g- nice looking gardens that are beautiful, that you'd be proud of. And then some, some techniques like the, you know what, if they're really breathing down your neck with a two, two story house and they're looking down over into your, your yard, plant a sacrificial plant that, that you know full well you're going to cut down in five years. I mean, I've done that technique more times than once. I'll overplant knowing that I want something really fast growing here because these evergreens, typically evergreens don't grow as fast as deciduous. Deciduous is plants that lose their leaves. Plants that go dormant in the winter, they are just growing faster. Maple will grow three, four, five feet in a year. The fastest growing Arizona cypress, you might get two. So it's it's a scale two to one. So, but... Willows lose their leaves in the winter, but typically you're not out there in the winter. And so you're really looking at when I'm out enjoying the patios or the decks or that, then I'm really, I need some real serious, you know, hot tub time. I want a real serious screen then. So there's some ideas. Anyway, I could keep going on and on. Ken Lane, the Waters, at Waters Garden Center, sorry, the Mountain Gardener. I lose track. Which hat am I on right now? The Mountain Gardener. We're doing radios and podcasts. Be right back. You're listening to local garden expert Ken Lane, the owner of Waters Garden Center. He can be found throughout the week at Waters Garden Center, located in Prescott, 1815 Iron Springs Road. Thanks for tuning in to The Mountain Gardener. Wondering why my garden looks amazing? Well, that's personal. The personal garden shopper service at Waters Garden Center, that is. Before talking with my personal shopper, I had no idea which plants would be best for me. But now my garden is bursting with flowers and buzzing with hummingbirds. Just go to watersgardencenter.com, click on shop, and choose personal garden shopper. A Waters Garden expert will pick the perfect plants for you, personally. The personal garden shopper, only at Waters Garden Center in Prescott. Hi, Lisa with the plants of the week and our single blue pinion pine. This new blue variety lends to a tidy appearance in a bold, tough tree. Highly desirable for its edible pine nuts. So eat up. Let it grow wild. Or this 10-foot tree can be shaped for the holidays. These perfectly formed trees are just $85 and only found at Waters Garden Center, 1815 Iron Springs Road in Prescott. Where people who love native pines and pine nuts, they love to shop. You've tuned in to The Mountain Gardener with local garden expert Ken Lane. Join him each week as he answers timely garden questions that are sure to make a difference in your gardens. Now welcome your host, Ken Lane. I tell you what I love about gardening is the seasonality of it, the changes, especially in a four season climate. There's always something pulsating new, different right now. Uh, the the poinsettias, the the Christmas tree, the amaryllis, the blooming hyacinth, all those holiday plants, they're kind of out. We, we've put, all of ours are gone. They're in the trash can. That's it. I'm tired of the holidays. I want it to be spring, you know, I want it to be spring. So we're starting to bring in more green traditional houseplants, tropicals. So it feels more like a, like a, a tropical porch that I want that living room feel to be green and vibrant and alive and so we've we've really upped the quantity huge truckloads of houseplants have shown up and so from from succulents and cacti to the trailing uh, tendrilled kind of of goldfish plants and pothos and philodendrons to upright palms and ficus it looks inviting looks exciting and then we've got this whole other series coming up the sp- the first of the spring plants are, sh- are showing up now just to have seed show up this week so the, all the seed the 2022 seed you know they've got to be rated that's one thing to i can share with you make sure if you're buying seed whether online or, or in store make sure you check that date you don't want old seed. So we have to verify. The state of Arizona says it must be within a single point, like a 92% uh, germination rate. And so we actually test them to make sure 90 to 92% or more of the seed germinate when 
when you plant them in the ground. And so it's very stringent. And then they certify them going, okay, you're good only for nine months. Then we have to recertify. So you really, from a, from a provider standpoint, a seed, we have seed license, all kinds of very complicated, uh, how we, the ability to sell seed. And so we always want freshness. Freshness is everything with seed. Make sure you check that date. You don't want seed left over from last year. They won't, they'll germinate, but not as well as you want. It'll be below that 92% germination rate. So that's one, uh, check for freshness, and then grab your seed. This, there are still shortages. Uh, you're not going to see, you can't just have anything you want whenever you want. If it's not in the store, I'll just get it online. No, it's, it's, it's out across the country. It's out. It, literally all of the poppy seed are gone on the country. So you, you'll see some of that. So grab them while you can. Uh, so as we get further in by May, the seed selection is going to be pretty, pretty thin. We'll probably let it run out because then we just have plants. We've got start starters. So we've already started our tomatoes and peppers and eggplants and the lettuce and all those crops. They're in the greenhouses. They are starting to grow either by cuttings or seed. And so we'll start having plants by then. So by first of April, May, June, July, we've got actual tomato plants, we've got zinnia plants, we've got geranium plants, not just seed. Some of those things you don't want to start by seed, they just take too long. Uh, some things do better by cuttings, so why we do that. So we go into this a lot with our garden classes. This weekend, we're doing how to design. So how to design a landscape with mountain plants. How to get privacies, what's the spacing, how much evergreen, how much shade trees, how many flowers, where do your vegetables go? We're going over that design in a landscape, going to details with that. Lots of hand handouts, lots of uh, you know formulas. It's very technical, this design thing, to get it right. Next week, it's on wildflowers. So I think that's January 29th, how to grow wildflowers. We grow wildflowers better than most other parts of the country. Our season's so long, yet we still have a definite winter. And wildflowers, the wildflowers, they need winter. Most perennial flowers, they need a winter. They need that cold to be able to rest, have their seed scarified or cracked open so they can germinate, so the new seedlings can take for you. Already, my wildflower patch, they're growing. I'm already starting to see the poppies are up. Probably not quite ankle high, but they're actively growing right now. I've got a fairly extensive wildflower patch. Uh, it's got to be at least 2,000 square feet. It's, it's substantial. It's, it's beautiful when it's in bloom. And it'll start blooming March through, through really the asters and mums kind of finish up in November. So it's a long, long bloom cycle. We grow wildflowers better than anyone else. Then it's, then it's fruit trees. All those classes, they're free. Every Saturday at 930, we offer a class. Please come. We want you to garden, have more garden success. So check watersgardencenter.com. There's a big class button right there. All, the entire spring schedule's right there. Throughout the week, Lisa and I camp out here at Waters Garden Center, and we love talking to fans of the show. As the days get longer and brighter, houseplants can struggle and scorch, but we have the solution. At Waters, we've organized our houseplants from A to Z for the brightest of sunny locations, many even bloom. With experts that know plants and how to make them grow. Shipments of the freshest houseplants in town have just arrived from A to Z and ready for a bright new home. Waters Garden Center, where people who love bright green houseplants, they love to shop found in Prescott. If you want a more fruitful garden, increase success in your landscape that just feels better, then tune in every week to The Mountain Gardener. Years of tips, tricks, and garden shortcuts are guaranteed to make your gardens nicer than ever. Listen to this podcast or read Ken's weekly garden column by visiting watersgardencenter.com. That's waters with two T's, gardencenter.com. Thanks for tuning in.